Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. We are a non-profit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This presentation and many others are available through our online library at instituteofcatholicculture.org and on our ICC app. Please view our upcoming schedule of live online events and engage with us on social media. For handouts, links, and further study materials, please visit this program's page on our website or app. Our speaker for this series is a priest in the Melkite Catholic Church of America and pastor of St. Elias Melkite Parish in San Jose, California. Father Sebastian Carnazzo earned his PhD in Biblical Studies at the Catholic University of America and has taught at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary of the Fraternity of St. Peter, St. Patrick's Seminary of the Archdiocese of San Francisco, and Christendom College. He continues to teach biblical studies and catechetics for a number of institutions. His dissertation was published under the title, Seeing Blood and Water, a Narrative Critical Study of John 1934. He is the author of many articles and the contributor to a number of multi-author works, most recently, the Great Adventure Bible of Ascension Press. He is also a frequent lecturer here at the Institute of Catholic Culture, as well as one of our teachers in the Magdala Apostolate. So it is my joy to welcome back to the Institute, Father Sebastian Carnazzo. Thank you, Kelsey. Okay, well, let's get started. We have a lot to cover tonight. So let's begin first, most importantly, with prayer. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, present all places and filling all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and dwell in us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O oh, good one. We are looking at the second part of our series tonight, and that is Heroines of the New Testament. If you were with us before, we examined the wonderful women of the Old Testament in the Heroines of the Old Testament, and I'm sure that you have already received the link for that. If not, Kelsey's going to send that to you. That is our preparation for what we're doing now. So we've got to know those Old Testament stories to understand the New Testament stories, of course, right? We know that saying by St. Jerome, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. I think Probably everybody in the ICC has heard that. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. People love quoting that. However, if you know that St. Jerome, that St. Jerome was there commenting on the book of Isaiah, the word scripture in the New Testament and in the early Christian writings in general, including all the way up to the time of St. Jerome, was frequently used just to refer to what you and I would call the Old Testament. They used that word, scripture, for the scriptures of Israel, okay? So when St. Jerome is saying that, what he's saying is ignorance of the Old Testament is ignorance of Christ. And so we've really got to know our Old Testament to appreciate the new. We don't have time tonight to redo our Heroines of the Old Testament course. Kelsey's going to send you the link for that if you missed it. But now we're going to jump into part two and which is built upon the work we already did, and that is heroines in the New Testament. And the best place to begin that conversation is in Luke chapter 1. So turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 5. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abishah, and he had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elisheva, Elizabeth. Elisheva means my God of oath, okay? So it's a reference to the covenantal, covenantal relationship of the God of Israel. Zechariah also, as you have had the other studies in the IC, probably already know this also is a reference. God remembers, Yahweh remembers. So it's a reference to that covenant as well. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. So here's our first heroine of the New Testament here, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, wife of Zechariah. What do we know about her so far? Well, she's a, a wife of a priest, 
She is of the line of Aaron. Priests were not required to marry a woman of the line of Aaron, nor even the tribe of Levi. They could marry a woman from any of the tribes. There were very few restrictions on this. There are a couple, but very few. And uh, she is not only a, a priest of a wife, but she's of the tribe of Levi, and she's specifically of the line of Aaron. So she's a she's a daughter of a priest. Okay, but we hear a tragedy. She's barren. Now, why is this such a problem? Ew, there's barrenness all over in salvation history. There's barrenness today. Okay, there's lots of barren. It happens, but the problem here is certainly magnified in that her husband, the greatest gift he has, his role in salvation history, is that he's a priest of the line of Aaron. But the priesthood of Aaron was passed on genetically from father to son. And so therefore, can you imagine this woman? She's barren. She's married this man. She's expected her primary job as a woman, as a wife, is to bear a son so that this man's priesthood, the line of Aaron, can continue. And tragically, she has no child. Now, as you know in salvation history, barrenness happens for two reasons, at least as explained in the Bible. We have barrenness of those who are cursed by God. Barrenness, if you go back and you read in Deuteronomy chapter 28, one of the curses of God upon the wicked is that they will lack fertility, okay? However, if you start thinking carefully, you remember there's an awful lot of barrenness among the blessed. Think of the barrenness of Sarah, the barrenness of Rebecca, the occasional barrenness of Leah and Rachel. I could go on. Okay, so the, the barrenness also is a way in which we find God highlighting the coming birth of a particularly important individual through the miraculous hand of God. Okay, so the this, of course, is one of those latter situations. But Luke has told us that they were walking the commands of God, ordinances, the Lord, they were blameless, right? To make sure you're, you're clear on this. This is not a curse from Deuteronomy 28, but rather they're going to be the parents of a very special child. Verse 8, now while they were serving as, pri as while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, it fell to him by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burnt incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. And he fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John. So it's the hour of prayer. Remember Psalm 140 or 141, however you want to count. Let my prayer arise like incense. So the, the smoke going up of the incense was a physical image they could see that their prayers were arising to God. Whether they could see him or not or hear him or not, prayer was arising to God and God would listen. Okay, so, so here he comes in at the hour of incense. He's going to offer incense on the altar of incense. And of course, what's he praying at the altar of incense at the hour of prayer? that he might someday have a child before he's dead, right? So the angel says, don't worry, your wife is going to have a son, and you shall name him John. What is John? This is a, this is a Hebrew word in the Greek there. Ioannis comes from the Hebrew, Johanna. Yahweh is gracious, right? God, Yahweh gives. He is the one who gives. He provides for you what you need, right? Okay, we hear some more about... Gabriel and Zechariah and their interaction. We can't get into that right now. We've done this in other ICC events. So we're going to jump over. We're going to focus in on the Elizabeth part of the story. This is verse 24. After these days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. And for five months, she hid herself, saying, Thus the Lord has done to me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Can you imagine this poor woman? Can you imagine her life? She's not just a barren woman. Okay, a barren woman would have been chastised by her friends and her family or people. What's wrong with you? You need to pray harder. What did you do? Why has God cursed you? She's done nothing. Nothing wrong. But can you imagine how magnified this is when it comes to the wife of a priest of the line of Aaron? 
whose sole job is to bear a son for her husband. And she has borne all this in silent humility. She does not know, she does not understand why this has happened. But she knows this, that God's hand is always in control, right? And so she remains quiet, she's humble, and she waits on the Lord. An important theme from the Garden of Eden to the end of the book of Revelation, wait on the Lord. She's waited on the Lord, and here in her old age, she's about to bear a child. And she hid herself, it says, she stayed in the home. And, and you can hear that reference there, where it says, she, it says, thus the Lord has done to me in the days when he looked upon me, right? Thus the Lord has done to me, having mercy upon me, to take away my reproach among men. Again, can you imagine what she has had to face every time she went to a well to get water, every time she was at a family gathering, her whole life since she's been married, she's waited on the Lord. And so here's the virtue we've been talking in the Old Testament class, Herons, the Old Testament, about the various virtues of woman. One of the virtues we find here in these Herons New Testament here is waiting on the Lord. Here is Elizabeth, this image of waiting on the Lord. Verse 26, in the sixth month, we come to another heroine here. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Literally in the Greek here, it's rejoice, you who have been filled with that which causes rejoicing. Okay, to kind of bring out the, the beauty of the roots here. Grace Charis in Greek means gift, okay, or, or that which brings about rejoice. In fact, the word joy in Greek is from the same root as gift or grace, charis. But she was greatly troubled the same. You know, have you ever had an angel show up all of a sudden in your house and say something like that to you? I think we can understand. She's a little, uh, this is a little odd. Okay, so she's troubled. What's this about? And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found charis, grace, with God grace with God. Translations vary there, favor and gift, but, but grace with God. There's a triple play off that root of joy or grace there. You have found grace with God. For you have found grace, and behold, you will conceive in your womb. So what's the gift? What grace has she received? What grace are we talking about? Jesus, right? The grace of God is Jesus, right? The great gift of God is the incarnation, right? Jesus is the grace, okay? There's no other grace but Jesus. Everything flows from who he is. Okay, so, so she's going to conceive the grace of God, right? The gift of God. John's gospel in the prologue, he talks about this in the same way, right? Okay, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Yahweh saves, Jesus. Yahweh saves, okay? He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So Mary, all Jews of the time, Mary, just like any of the Jews in the first century, was waiting for the return of the Messiah, the anointed king of the line of David, right? They hadn't had the anointed king of the line of David since the Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem in 587. So they're waiting for the return of the king, the return of the Messiah, the return of the Christ, the anointed king. And so, and, and they knew because Daniel had promised, Daniel chapter 9, we heard from Gabriel's prophecy. Gabriel, the angel, appeared to Daniel centuries earlier and foretold the coming of the Christ and the chronology of when this would occur. So here's now Gabriel appearing now. To, at the conclusion of the story, right? So this is Daniel chapter 9 being concluded here now in Luke chapter 1. Those of you who have been in ICC for a while know all this stuff. I'm probably boring you. Okay, so now she gets this message that she's going to be the long way, the, the mother of the long way to return of the Messiah of the line of David. This is not a huge surprise. She's betrothed to a man of the house of David. She herself, as far as we can tell from early Christian tradition, is of the house of David, though that doesn't really matter. It's what is her husband. The 
Messiah, the house of David, would return at this time was prophesied by Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, the prophecy of, of Gabriel, the prophet, the, the angel. So the only surprise might be that, oh, I'm the one? That's nice. Okay. But the, the fact that this was going to happen at this moment is not a great surprise. I, I think our natural reaction, any of the women here would hear this and can probably understand this a little better than the men here, but would probably be, wow, man, I just hit the jackpot, right? I mean, you just pulled the lever at Vegas and the coins came flying, right? You were the lucky one of all the people who pulled the lever. But something funny happens here. Mary, instead of saying, wow, I was really lucky. I should go to Vegas. She says, uh, how can this be since I, know no, I do not know man? That's a weird response. That's a really weird response. St. Augustine, St. Gregor of Nyssa both point out, as the early Christian tradition held, that Mary was a temple virgin and that this refers to her vow of virginity. For Mary, it's impossible to her, for her to conceive. Yes, she's married, she betrothed, to a, a man of the house of David. But that doesn't mean she's going to have children from him. Temple virgins did not, did not have relations with their guardian husbands. The guardian husbands just took them into their home when they began to menstruate, 12, 13 years old, a temple virgin, excused from the temple. And then they went to a, a guardian home where they were cared for. For example, Joseph, the old, the elderly Joseph here. This is why, by the way, in all the imagery of Joseph, all the way up until just about a century ago, Joseph was always pictured as an old man with long gray beard. He was an elderly man, a widower, who was requested to take into his home a temple virgin. Okay, this is the ancient tradition. Uh, today, ever since the, the advent of the recent feast, St. Joseph the Worker, and now you have pictures of St. Joseph with nice biceps and hammers, people have all sorts of other ideas of Joseph. But Again, that gets into what we talked about before the class, and that is how dangerous bad artwork is. But that's for another lecture. Okay, so now, what is, she said, how can this be for I know not man? I, I'm a temple virgin. I, I have no relations with men. Yes, I'm betrothed to Joseph, house of David, but nothing's happening there. And he says, don't worry, we worked all this out. Okay, so the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child will be born and be called holy, that is uniquely the Son of God. Not just a Son of God like all other sons of David. Sons of David were called sons of God because God cared for them in a special way. This goes back to 2 Samuel 7. But this child will be uniquely a Son of God, different from all the other sons of God before, different from all the other Messiahs, the Christs. This one will be naturally a son of God from all eternity and adopted in the house of David. The sons of David were natural sons of David adopted in the house of God. Here now, the son of David, the, the son of God will be adopted by Joseph into the house of David. We've talked about this in other lectures. Okay. So then look at what Mary says now. It says, and, and behold, your kinswoman, Elizabeth, this comes back to our earlier story, age, who in her old age has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. So you have two barrenness stories here. You have Elizabeth, the barren one, and Mary, the barren one. They're barren for different reasons. One is barren naturally. One is barren because of a vow. But both of them, by the hand of God, will will overcome their barrenness. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So here's another virtue of woman, of the, the heroines of the Bible here. Not only have we seen this waiting on the Lord from Elizabeth, but now we also see acceptance of God's will. Right? Can you imagine Mary trying to figure this thing out? For us, we put icing over this whole story, nice frosting. It's nice and sweet. Oh, yeah, of course. We look at this in hindsight. Can you put yourself in her situation? She's a temple virgin. 
She's taken a vow of virginity for her whole life. As she's been removed from the temple precinct to be in a guardian home where she's expected to still maintain her virginity, her marriage to the temple, marriage to God. And now she's been told that she's going to get pregnant. I think a lot of people here, if I, I might want to ask some questions. Uh, Gabriel, uh, before you go, uh, how is this going to work out? This, this kinda, there's going to be some public uh, issues here. What does she do? She accepts the word of the Lord. Simply says, let it be done according to your word. And she receives the word of God. She conceives the word of God at that moment, right? Now, again, can you imagine? I'll bet you she didn't have a, didn't sleep much that night. Can you imagine trying to think, how is this? What is, what am I going to do? How am I going to explain this? How am I going to explain to Joseph? How am I going to explain to the temple precinct and the authorities that this was a miracle and an angel appeared to me? Can you imagine? I'll bet you she had some sleepless nights. Okay, so, but Mary simply accepts the word of the Lord. So not only waiting on the Lord, Elizabeth, but accepting the will of the Lord. Same thing here, right? The same, the same theme in many ways, two, two sides of the same coin. Okay, now what happens? In verse 39, Mary goes to the hill country Judea, and she comes to Elizabeth. The, the village here, Ayn Karim, where John the Baptist was, where, where he was born, where Elizabeth and Zechariah were, it's a, it's a Levitical village. That's not far from Jerusalem. It's just over the hill, basically. If you've ever been on an ICC trip with us, the Holy Land, you've been there. And so Mary goes over to that area. She, she was at this point probably in Nazareth. She goes over to Ayn Karim. This would have taken her maybe a couple days, maybe three, four days journey. And she comes there and cares for Elizabeth in her old age. So here again, we see virtue of woman in the Bible. Here she, here she is. She's now pregnant. Any ladies here have been pregnant? You know how the first couple of days go? First couple of weeks? Can you imagine? Morning sickness, the rest. Mary goes in these first couple of weeks of her pregnancy, journeys to go see her cousin, her relative Elizabeth, to do what? To care for someone else. To care for someone else here. So this incredible gift of womanhood, right? It, it, can you think of anything that more encapsulates or enunciates the woman than this, right? What is a mother, but one who gives her body, her life for another, right? This is, this is what, this is what being a mother is all about, right? I mean, physically even. Okay. So here she, even before she given birth, she is already this image of motherhood. She goes to care for someone else who is in need, right? Gives of herself. And I, I guarantee that was not an easy journey, especially in the first couple of weeks of pregnancy. Okay, so now when she appears to Elizabeth, so now we have these two women, these two heroines interacting here. So it says, this is verse 42. She exclaimed with a loud cry, this, this is Elizabeth, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Verse 43, and why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb left for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken of to her from the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now, what's going on there in the image in Luke's gospel? Luke is reminding us of an important story in the Old Testament. Two stories, in fact. Let's hold your hand there and flip back with me back to 1 Samuel. Flip back with me to 1 Samuel. So you're going to go back to your Old Testament, early part of your Old Testament. You're going to find your Pentateuch. And then eventually you're going to come to 1 Samuel. This is the story of Hannah. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we hear about a man who has two wives. You know, in the Old Testament, in the, in the Mosaic Law, there was an allowance, not, in, not the ideal, but there was an allowance that a man could have more than one wife. And so this man has two wives. One of the wives is Hannah. Okay, so, but there's a problem. While one wife, Peninnah, has had multiple children, Hannah has had none. She's barren. 
And so when they go to the place where the meeting tent was at this time, this was not Jerusalem. This is before the time of Jerusalem. This is when the meeting tent was still in Shiloh. So they went to Shiloh where the meeting tent was. It was long before Jerusalem and the temple and all that to offer sacrifice. The man brought his two wives and the children, of course, of his of one wife who was fertile. And when he offered sacrifice, part of the sacrificial system is in some sacrifices, portions are given, the animal's given, the priest takes some of it, throws it on the altar for God, the priest takes some of it, and then the rest is given back to the offerer. So when he receives his portions of the sacrifice, some nice little chunks of tri-tip, he gives some of it, he gives a, a big pile of it to Penina so she can distribute to her kids who are standing there. But to Hannah, he only gives one portion. She's only one person. So she gets each person gets one portion. And this was a very difficult time for Hannah because here, Penina, this other woman, receives a pile of food for her kids, a sign of her fertility, while Hannah receives only one portion. So Hannah remains there at the meeting tent and begins to pray. And she's praying and praying, and the Lord hears her prayer. And so we hear after afterwards that the Lord opens her womb and gives her the power to conceive. He takes away her barrenness and makes her fertile. And so the next time she has relations with her husband, she conceives. And she had promised that, oh Lord, if you allow me to conceive at least once, I will give back to him what you have given me. I will give back to you, oh Lord. And, and so this is what happens. This boy named Samuel Hannah bears. And the next time they go to offer sacrifice, she brings this child to the meeting tent. And she says, here, priest Eli, this is what the Lord has given me, and I give him back to the Lord. And so Eli receives this child Samuel, and he becomes one of the, the kids who are donated to the temple, like Mary eventually is later on, right? One of these dedicated virgins. So Samuel is then given to the temple, and Samuel now, or to the meeting tent, and Samuel now serves there, okay? And Hannah then breaks out in this beautiful hymn. This is chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside thee. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bowels of the, the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren have borne seven, but she who had many is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. So what the hymn is about the fact that God can do anything, right? He's the God Almighty. He can take those who are powerful and rich and make them weak and poor. And those who are weak and poor, he can make powerful and rich. The Lord can do anything. This is her beautiful song as she celebrates the fact that she's given birth, right? And then look what she says at the end of this song. This is the last line of her song, verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. Look at this. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his Christ, his Messiah, his anointed one. That is the first time in salvation history that the word anointed Christ, Messiah, appears, is in Hannah's hymn. And Luke wants to make sure we pay attention to this, because the this is long before they have an anointed king. This is long before they have an anointed king. So the king, the king who is at this point God, who will eventually be manifest in a in an earthly way, in that in that form of the, the anointed king, right? This this individual who will do the work of God among his people, and eventually be fulfilled in Jesus, who is both the divine and human king, right? Both of the line of David and of the line of God. Okay, so this is the first reference to this is a beautiful hymn, and look at her name, Hannah. 
The woman who gives birth here is Hannah. Her name Hannah means, this is Hannah is the Hebrew word grace, right? Lady grace, okay? Hannah, Lady Grace. So Luke is already hoping we're catching these references, right? In, in those, that, that beautiful image of rejoice, you who have been filled with grace. And then we end up with that beautiful hymn. But there's another hymn that Luke's hoping we're going to catch here. And that is in Zephaniah. Flip over in your Bibles to your prophets for a section, for a second. Do your prophets here. This is Zephaniah. How are you going to find Zephaniah? He's a very short little prophet. I have no idea how tall he was, but his book is very short. So find Zechariah first. Look for Zechariah. Zechariah. Once you're at Zechariah, rewind, and you'll find Haggai, and then little short Zephaniah. He might have been very tall. I don't know. So Zephaniah, okay, Zephaniah. Zephaniah prophesies about the restoration of the kingdom in this way. This is in chapter three. This is one of my most favorite chapters of the prophets. In Zephaniah chapter three, he talks about how Jerusalem has become like an adulterous wife. She has harloted herself off to the nations. She's sold herself out for hire. Okay, so this, this horrible, wicked Jerusalem, which is worshiping pagan gods and filled with, with not only idolatry, but also every sin you can imagine. This is Jerusalem just before the Babylon exile, okay? But then in stark contrast to that, he describes the new Jerusalem in the restoration as this daughter Zion who is pure. And that is in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11. We'll start there. Chapter 3, verse 11. On that day when the kingdom is restored, after I chastised you, okay, the whole thing, okay. You shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you had rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. So the first half of the chapter is a description of Jerusalem, this wicked woman, bride of God, who has become like a harlot or an adulteress, filled with wickedness. But in the restoration, he says, you will no longer be ashamed of what you did because I will have removed from you all the wicked. And of course, that's what happens, of course, during the Babylonian exile. Verse 12, for I will leave in the midst of you a people humble and lowly. They shall seek the refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel. So they'll, they'll, they will not be polytheists. They'll be monotheists. They'll, they'll be they'll worship the one true God contrast to the first half of the chapter. They shall do no wrong, utter no lies, nor shall be found in their mouth, receive all tongue, for they shall pass here and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. And look at this. Look at this, verse 14. Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. That word right there, rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Translations vary, sing aloud, who knows what you got there in your Bible. That's the exact same word in Luke 128. Rejoice, O daughter Zion. This is what Luke's hoping when you hear Chere. He's not thinking you're going to have some Bible passage you can whack your, bio, your Baptist friend over the head with, okay? No, he's hoping you're going to hear an echo of Zephaniah, daughter Zion, the restoration of the kingdom. Chere, rejoice, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad, exalt with all your, your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cast out your enemies. Hear the, hear the Magnificat there? The king of Israel, that is Yahweh, is within you. Right. So here's this whole image in Zephaniah that the new Jerusalem would conceive within her that God would someday return to dwell among his people in the temple. This is what Luke's hoping you're seeing here. That all the images of, Ze of Zephaniah and all the prophets are being fulfilled at this moment. Mary is the new temple of God because within her, the word of God will be conceived. God himself will dwell and will be the beginning of the restoration. As you continue to read in Zephaniah here, you can hear all sorts of references to the Magnificat. Uh, verse 16, on that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, right? Be not afraid, Mary, where the angels said, 
Yet let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is within you, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over your gladness and renew you in his love. Look at that marital language there. It's very important for Luke's gospel. Mary's a temple virgin. For Luke's audience, they're wondering, how can a temple virgin conceive a child? Wait a minute. This is the hand of God. Okay, so, and then look at verse 19. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast. You're here in the Magnificat, I hope, right? Okay, so so Luke, let's go back to Luke's gospel now. So what Luke's doing here is he's hoping you're going to hear Mary in light of daughter Zion, this restoration of the kingdom, this restoration of the kingdom. And who is she? She is one who has heard the word of God and has received it, has accepted it, right? And if she has accepted the word of God is within her by the power of the Holy Spirit, And now she becomes the manifestation of the restoration of the kingdom of God, which, of course, is a very important image for all of us that we have become through our baptism, of course. All right. So now in Luke's gospel, we hear the rest of the Magnificat. We don't have time to read the whole thing. We're going to run out of time here. So now in verse 56, look at verse 56. This is Luke chapter 1, verse 56. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Now, the time for Elizabeth to be delivered, she gave birth to a son. So Mary's image here, Luke has done something very significant for us. He has shown us that Mary is this daughter Zion who's going to conceive the word of God within her, right? She's going to be the new Jerusalem. Well, if that's the case, then this child who is born in her womb is not just of the son of David, that's not, he's not just the long way to anointed king of the Lamb David. He's the divine king. He's God. He's the word of God in the flesh. And if he's in the word of God in the flesh, then Mary is the Ark of the Covenant. And so what Luke will do here now is show us images that are going to remind us of that from 2 Samuel chapter 6, after David has come to Jerusalem and conquered it. In chapter 6, he brings the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. It comes through the hill country of Judea. Mary comes through the hill country of Judea. The Ark remains there in the hill country of Judea for three months. Mary remains in the hill country of Judea here for three months. David says, how is it that that the Ark of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth says, how is it the mother of my Lord should come to me? It goes on and on. There's tons of these parallels, okay? Luke's expecting you're going to hear these things. You say, well, how could he expect that? Well, they didn't have MTV, okay? They weren't raised on Sesame Street, the electric company, and MTV, and CNN, and who knows what else today, okay? They were raised on not the bad news, but the good news, okay? This is what they knew. The Psalms, they had memorized. There's not a Jew in the first century, a pious Jew in the first century, who couldn't have sung every psalm for you from beginning to end. No doubt. There's no debate about that among biblical scholars. He said, how could they do that? You have 150 songs memorized yourself, but it's Snoop Doggy Dog and Blue Suede Shoes and who knows what, okay? So we, we've got to get back to the Bible, the Word of God, this, the songs of God, and then we can understand these kinds of texts. Okay, so Mary. Mary, we see her here. First of all, the first image of Mary is she is mother of Messiah, right? Let it be done according to your word. This is going to be very difficult. I don't understand how it's all going to work out, but I accept the hand of God. Okay, we, we see that image right there. She's the mother of the Messiah. That's the first image we have of her. You shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall inherit the throne of his father, David. But there's another image of Mary here, and that is this image that she is the Ark of the Covenant. The glory cloud will overshadow you. That word, in this is in, in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That word in Greek is episkiadzin. This is a unique Greek word that appears in only four places in the New Testament, okay? Really only two places, but four in a sense. Okay. If you go back in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Hebrew trans was translating to Greek. The Jews translated this about 200 years before Christ. And when they translated the verb shikan, 
In other words, to refer to the dwelling of God upon the ark, they used one Greek word and used only for one for this instance, episkiadzin, overshadow. So when you're a Jew in the first century in Greek and you hear episkiadzin, the first thing that clicks in your mind is the glory cloud of God overshadowing the ark. And it's quite obvious that not only did they do this in the Old Testament Greek text, but the New Testament authors were aware of this. And that's why this word appears only in four places in the entire New Testament. Three of them are the same story. The transfiguration, when the glory cloud overshadows the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The only other occurrence of this word in the entire New Testament is right here. So it's obvious the New Testament authors are aware of the technical use of this term in Jewish Greek literature. They preserve that that tradition, that this is a reference to the glory cloud overshadowing. The most important reference for us in the Old Testament, of course, is in Exodus chapter 40, verse 35. You can go back and read this on your own. In Exodus chapter 40, verse 35, it says, when Moses finished building the, the meeting tent, the glory of the Lord overshadowed the meeting tent, rested upon it. That Greek word there is episkiadzin. And that's what Luke's hoping you're going to think of when you hear this. So what we hear is, first of all, that Mary is going to be the long way, the, the mother of the Messiah. This is a wonderful thing, a great honor. But the child born in her womb is not just the son of David, the long way Messiah, but also the divine king they've been waiting for since the glory cloud disappeared from the temple. Remember, they were waiting for the return of two kings the divine king, and the king of the line of David. In Jesus, Luke shows us both are fulfilled. And therefore, Mary is the Ark of the Covenant, because Jesus is the Word of God. And this is that next image, okay? And then we come to the third image of Mary here, and that is Mary going to the house of Elizabeth, which, of course, this is, this is all, there's no clear lines in the whole text here. The images overlap each other. But look at what Mary does now. She goes to the hill country of Judea, right? She goes to Elizabeth. And there's that ark image, of course. We already talked about that. But look at what she does with herself. Here she is, the mother of the long way to Messiah, the ark of the covenant. And she goes to someone who is in need, which in the end is really the fulfillment of both of those first two roles. Mother, mother, mother. Giving of herself the sake of another. And that's what we see Mary doing throughout all of this. And so we find in Elizabeth, not only our first heroine of the New Testament, this waiting on the Lord. And we're going to see, as you continue to read in Luke's gospel here, then we hear about the birth of John, who's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah, the forerunner of the return of the glory cloud, both the human and divine king, the image of waiting on the Lord our first heroine of the New Testament. In Mary, we find this woman who receives the word of God. And again, you've got to put yourself in the historical context. This was not an easy message to hear. How can I be the mother of a child if I'm a temple virgin? Well, this is a great honor to be the mother of the long-awaited return of the king. Ah, uh, there's some complications here we're going to need to work out. And can you imagine the public ridicule associated with this. Imagine poor Joseph trying to deal with this. Humility, receiving the word of God in all humility. And then we see Mary as this one who has received not just the long way Messiah, but the word of God incarnate. And what does she do? She takes the presence of God to those who need it, right? She goes to Elizabeth immediately to offer her help. She's a mother of mother of mothers here, continuously giving that image of motherhood. And then finally, our th last heroine, after we hear in chapter two about the birth of Jesus, again, Mary kind of fades out here a little bit from the story. We hear about the story of the birth of John the Baptist. And then chapter two, we hear about the birth of Jesus. And then they go to the temple to offer Jesus to the temple. This is in chapter two. Verse 22, and then we hear about 
priest or the, the holy man Simeon among the fathers to debate exactly who he was. This, this holy man Simeon, who realizes when he picks up Jesus, the baby Jesus, he's seen the salvation of his people. And then we come to verse 34. So Simeon says, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is spoken against. That is, this kid is going to cause trouble. Okay. To put it in modern, simple English. Imagine my mom hearing this and a sword will pierce through you as well through your own soul in English. The word soul is in modern English. We think of our spiritual essence here, but the, the word here, your personhood. Okay. So a sword will also pierce through you. So he's going to be a cause of trouble. There's going to be fights and wars. Okay. Over him. And you're going to be pierced with a sword as well. That's not nice information to hear at this moment. Okay. So, so here she has this wonderful news. <laughs> Pairing the Messiah, the long way Messiah, who she already understands in a, in, a, in some ways is, is mysteriously also the presence of God among them. Not only the, the human king, but the divine king. He's the restoration of the kingdom. And now she hears that this child will grow up and there's going to be big problems. And she herself will suffer as a result of it as well. Of course, she's going to see this her whole life especially in Jesus' earthly ministry. You can imagine Nazareth, how often she heard women at the well talking about her son in all sorts of positive and negative ways. Can you imagine in Nazareth when they want to take Jesus and push him off the cliff? A lot of things going on there that Mary had to endure. And then, of course, tragically, at the end, when she saw him hanging on the cross and finally heard the fulfillment of these words, this poor woman a sword has certainly pierced her heart at this moment, trying to understand how can this be? How can this, how can this all work out? It's really the same questions that she asked Gabriel at the beginning. How can this be for I know not man? How can this be for he's the long way Messiah? Now he's dead on the cross. How can this be my son, my son? And then came the resurrection. And then came the good news. And our third heroine here is in verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phenuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and as a widow till she was 84. So it's hard to know exactly what she was here. Why? Some would suggest she was a temple virgin who has now returned back to the temple in her old age, in her widowhood, to give service to the temple, wherever the case may be, she's at the temple and serving at the temple in some mysterious way. She did not depart from the temple, it says, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to God and spoke to him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And so we find then in Elizabeth, in Mary, in Anna or Hannah, we find that these three women have lived a life incredibly complex in so many ways, but have been the, the ones who have waited on the Lord, like Elizabeth, who have heard the word of the Lord and received it, accepted it, no matter what that might mean. And it was very complicated, and I guarantee, for Mary and Joseph. And here's Anna at the very end of her life, serving at the temple, picking up the word of the Lord in her hands and realizing she is seeing now the salvation of God. And what does she do with it? Like Mary did, she proclaimed it to those who needed to hear it, right? Mary goes to Elizabeth. Here, Anna goes out and proclaims the word of God. And this is the incredible virtue of woman. She receives the word of God. But she does not just keep it to herself. She gives birth to it, to those who are around her, who are in need of the manifestation of the revelation of God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to age of ages. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Sebastian.
Wow, we covered quite a lot in this first part, and I cannot wait to see how many women of the New Testament we get to in the second part. There's a lot more, I'm sure. All right, so let's get to the questions. I noticed, Susan, why don't you go ahead and get started, and I'm going to try to read through some of the questions that have come in. So go ahead and unmute yourself, Susan. Father, I have noticed in in this study that every time they mention a barren woman, or uh, the women that you mentioned in the New Test in the New Testament and the Old Testament, you say they're advanced in age, except Anna. He actually mentions that she was eighty-four. Is there any significance in that, or is it just the writer's way of of explaining things? So the Anna that we just read, this last one. So the question is: There's no mention of her being barren. Is that what you mean? No, a, a, they, it's the only time that her age is mentioned. All the other women are advanced in age. Oh, I see. Okay, so you have a specific date or specific age given here. I don't know, Susan. That's a really great question. I can't see of any particular significance of advanced in age versus a particular number. But I will tell you this: just because I can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. One of my professors in our doctoral program at Catholic University, I remember he said to us in class one time, when you're reading the Bible and you see a number, the first thing you ask yourself, is there there some sort of important symbolic image there? And after you've exhausted any possibilities, then you can conclude no. So that's interesting, Susan. I don't know. I would it would be interesting to look at the number 84 and see where it appears in the Bible in general. That'd be my first thought. We'd do a little Bible study on the number 84 in the Bible and see if there's something else here we're not catching. So that's a really great question, Susan, but I don't know the answer. And Kelsey's supposed to screen these questions, of course, and only give me questions that are easy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Okay. I'll give you a pass, but maybe we can find an answer. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. All right, Father, we are getting a couple questions coming in that are related, and I'm going to try to summarize them. This is coming from Adrian, Bonnie, and Robert, and they're all asking, essentially, how much would Mary have known about what would happen in the life of Jesus, either based on what she knew about the Old Testament or from what the angel revealed to her at that time? Okay. What do we know about Mary? We know she was obviously a Jew of the first century. Jews of the first century tended to know their old, what we would call the Old Testament scriptures very well. By the fact that she broke out in song, that is clearly an echo of Hannah's hymn and references to the daughter Zion from Zephaniah means she had a decent grasp of her Old Testament. That's just the the basic information there. If she was of a pious realm, which we would assume she was from our knowledge of who Joachim and Anna were, and she was a temple virgin, as far as the early Christian tradition holds, then she would have had an exceptional knowledge of the Old Testament, particularly the Psalms, from her time in the temple until she was of the age of about 12 or 13 or somewhere in there. So she would have heard the Psalms in the temple being sung continuously her entire life, every day, all day long, nonstop, she would have been hearing the Psalms being sung. So she would have known the Psalms probably from memory. Very many pious Jews of the first century would have been able to do something like that too, but she certainly would have had this from her childhood. And then, of course, the grace of God here, of course, of just exceptional grace given to this particular individual to be able to hear the word of God and receive it her whole life not just in the incarnation, but just hearing the word of God in the Psalms and receiving it and meditating on making it her own, right? Incarnating it in her life. And so I would expect that Mary had a very good grasp among Jews the first century about uh, as good as you could hope of who the long, the long way Messiah would be and how, we, how it would work out some of the basics. That would include Isaiah's suffering servant Psalms which were references to the Messiah who was to come, who would do great things, but would also suffer in the midst of his work. And so Mary also would have likely known very well, if not could have sung them, the suffering servant psalms from the book of Isaiah. So 
with all that in mind, I'm sure Mary had a <laughs> a really good grasp of the potential of who the long way Messiah would be. However, what happened in Jesus's life, his ministry was a revelation of God. It was new in a certain sense, revelatory. His, from his baptism all the way to his passion, death and resurrection was revelatory. And so Mary was certainly learning along the way also, but a good student who is learning is one who has prepared for the course, right? And so Mary would be certainly one of those good students who was well prepared as a Jew of the first century to understand and grasp the various mysteries of the life of Jesus. Wonderful. Thank you. You mentioned the suffering servant, and we actually have an ICC talk that Monsignor Pope did on those four passages. So I'll include that in the, in the follow-up study. Yeah. Great. Okay, we're getting a number of questions coming in about this topic, which is, can you just briefly clue us into what exactly a temple virgin is? So first of all, a temple virgin, we hear references to them in the Old Testament in two places. So in Exodus chapter 38, verse 8, so if you hold your Bible, turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 38, this is the story of Moses making the meeting tent okay and he's building all the parts for it and in the midst of the description of the meeting tent we get this really bizarre reference at least bizarre i think to our modern ears but apparently it was not considered bizarre back then because there's no explanation look at this exodus chapter 38 verse 8 this is in the middle of the description of building the meeting tent and he made the laver the bowl of bronze and its base of bronze, so this is the thing that the priests would wash their hands in, from the mirrors of the ministering women who minister the tent of meeting. The who? The what? Excuse me? Moses, could you elaborate there, please? Who are they? Okay, so they don't just appear there. There's not only, not only a reference there. So you hear about these women who are ministering the door of the tent of meeting. What are they? The first guess, I think, for most people would be, well, they're the wives of the priests, maybe. However, that's impossible. If you flip over to 1 Samuel. So we were already looking at this story. This is in 1 Samuel now. Shortly after the passage we were looking at, in 1 Samuel chapter 2. After this song of Hannah, we hear about Eli, the high priest, and his two sons. And the two sons are not the best characters. It says that they were stealing the food during the sacrifices. When people would bring a sacrifice, instead of taking the best portion and putting it on the altar, they'd take the best portion for themselves first and set it aside. Then they'd throw some extra stuff on the altar and give the rest of the people. So they're stealing from God. Bad move. And then it goes on to describe them in this way. It says in chapter 2, verse 22, now, Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel. And even more grievously, ready? And how they lay with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Okay, so who are the, obviously there's not the priests' wives. Okay, there's three priests in the story. There's Ali and his two boys. Okay, his two sons, and so these are some other ladies. Okay, so these are women who minister the door, of the tent of meeting. Again, notice there's no explanation of who they are. It just goes along. The, the author assumes his audience knows who they are. That this is some sort of a a, a normal institution, and so. When we get to the New Testament era, we have another document that describes something like this, aside from, by the way, the story of Samuel, who was left at the temple by Hannah, another kind of example, this kind of thing. But uh, we have in the New Testament, the story in the Proto-Evangelion of St. James. Kelsey, I think my brother did a lecture on this, didn't he? So the Proto-Evangelion of St. James, it's an early Christian text which summarizes the early Christian traditions about Mary. 
that she was a temple virgin. She was a, a woman who ministered the door of the tent of meeting, along with a bunch of other girls at that time. Joachim and Anna, in their old age, conceived. And again, barrenness, highlight a special birth. And when she, Mary was born, realizing that they wouldn't be around to marry her off, and also realizing this was a great gift of God, like Hannah dedicating Samuel to the temple, they dedicated Mary to the temple. She became a temple virgin. The feast of the presentation of the Virgin Mary is a feast in which we remember this moment. Mary was then received into the temple. There are beautiful stories about this. And she was received with the other temple virgins. And what did she do? Well, for the next couple of years of her life, she took care of things around the temple. You know, men don't take care of places very well. You ever seen a bachelor pad? So the, the women ministering at the temple, you know, polish the silver, windex the windows, clean the place up. Okay. So the linens and things like that. But the, as soon as these w- young women got to the age of menstruation, they were excused from being on the temple property, right? You couldn't have blood on the temple. So in, in when they were around 12, 13, they would be married off to an older man in the community, a widower, typically, who was known in the community to be respectful and, and righteous and wise and would take the individual into their home and, and be basically a guardian for this girl. Because in that time, a woman had no legal rights aside from her father, Joachim's now dead, her husband, Mary does not have one, or a, a, an elder son. Okay, she does not yet have an older son. So you've got to give these temple virgins some sort of protection and care in the society. And so these temple virgins would be married off to older men in the community who would who would be legally married to them. But obviously, everyone knew the arrangement. They were temple virgin guardians. This is what Joseph was. Joseph was chosen to be a temple virgin guardian. And the fact that you always see him with his staff with the white flowers is a sign of that. Artists today will, you know, give a statue of Joseph, usually with nice biceps, but with he's got a white flower in his hand. That's a relic, a remnant of an earlier tradition of Joseph always being shown with a staff with white blossoms coming out of it, which goes back to an early Christian story that when they had to figure out who was going to be the guardian of this particular temple virgin, they would figure out, call them in, whoever's available. Okay, Joseph was one of them. They gathered him up from the villages. Okay, Joseph came in, and they said, okay, I'll put all your staffs into the temple. Tomorrow morning you come back, we'll see if the Lord has given us a sign. The next morning they come back, Joseph's walking stick had blossomed almond blossoms. And now hopefully you're thinking, uh, that sounds like Aaron. And the whole thing where they they were wondering whether Aaron was supposed to be the high priest to care for the sanctuary, and they, they were debating about who could be the, the real high priest, and God showed that Aaron was the one chosen by God to be the high priest, the place where God dwelt among his people. So this is what's going on in the story, of course. Joseph is of the line of David, the order of Melchizedek, the priest of Melchizedek, Psalm 110. And so he is going to be the high priest, the caregiver, the protector of the sanctuary, the meeting tent, where God will come to dwell among his people. Like Aaron was the old covenant, here Joseph of the new covenant. There's a lot here, uh, Kelsey, we could go on for an hour. (laughs) I think we could. Yeah. Probably a whole semester we could go on. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that's great. Thank you so much, Father Sebastian. We do have a talk on the Proto-Evangelium of St. James, so I'll include that link as well. So we've we've talked about a number of links. All of these will be posted on the talk page under the button that says posted content. So I'll, I'll say that in the follow-up email, but you'll be able to access those. And hopefully you wrote down many different scripture references during the lecture and the Q&A. So you'll have something to look at this week if you have time to review your notes in in preparation for next week's class where we will continue discussing the women of the new testament father sebastian thank you so much for being with us this evening thank you great to yeah be here. and thank you everybody i look forward to seeing all of you next week in the meantime god be with you and we'll see you next time we hope you enjoyed this program from the institute of catholic culture Remember to download our app and share our online library with friends, co-workers, and family members. To learn more, get involved, and support the Institute's work, 
visit instituteofcatholicculture.org and visit us on social media.